something that I found really interesting um, at the time. So when I first got into cryptocurrency, I I, I was I guess, 2018 and a friend of mine was like, hey, buy, uh, buy XRP. And I was like, oh, yeah, sounds great. Yeah, bank of coin. Um, so that's how I got involved in it. Right. And um, then I developed from there. But that's something that you know I still find interesting is what happens there. And, and one of the most interesting things, and this is kind of something that I don't know if you were on the council when uh, Coinbase listed the token, uh, decided to list it or not, but obviously they then made the decision to delist it when the SEC lawsuit happened. Uh, and I kind of find the lawsuit fascinating because unlike everyone else, they've then gone, yeah, no, screw you. They're going to fight this and see what happens. So that's, yeah. I, I, I kind of keep track of it every here and there because I yeah. find it quite like an interesting it's, uh, who, who knows what's going to happen? And I feel like that's going to have implications for lots of exchanges as well, who will have listed that Coinbase included, but loads of others who, in the US who will have listed that token in the past and maybe still do have that token available for sale. Um, so I suppose, like, I don't know what 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 is your opinion on that like lawsuit outside of anyone's personal opinions on the token? Yeah. What is your opinion on the lawsuit itself? Like, because I, I haven't seen much about it in the last few weeks um yeah, it's been a little quiet lately um yeah yeah i mean so i think that i mean for if obviously if i worked at ripple my this opinion would be different but for me as an attorney i feel like regardless of the outcome it could be a positive thing for the industry because it might i think that both sides um the sec and ripple are having to sort of show show their cards a little bit in this process. Um, I've seen some interesting documentation that's come from like other law firms that were involved um, and, and just like why the SEC feels like maybe Ripple uh, XRP is a security and ETH wasn't or isn't. Um, so I think that anything that we can like glean from that lit lawsuit is important because I agree with you. Most of the time we're seeing enforcement actions and settlements like BlockFi. And so none of that is public information. You don't really understand the reasoning behind it or how they got to that number. Um, so this is, is exposing more. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, not speaking, you know, about Coinbase specifically, but just and not even speaking about XRP specifically, like exchanges are at a risk and do need to have like a delisting procedure when the regulatory climate around a project changes. Um, and eventually, I think you're right. I mean, I think it's very reasonable to expect that at some point, some exchange um, is going to have some issue with the SEC because of tokens that were launched. And, um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the most confusing thing to me about the SEC is they've been very clear that something can start off as a security and change and and turn into not a security. Um, Don't you all, think that's like an extremely arbitrary arbitrary distinction? Like I, what I think it's, what constitutes yeah, it's all, that? It's all like so fact intensive, and it's almost a matter of opinion, right? And for me, I mean, uh, for the Ripple case, like I I think Ripple is putting up a really good fight. I think it's really hard to win against a regulator because they make the rules and then they explain why something violates the rules and um i think that ripple and other uh projects who have tried to do it the right way have things to point to and legal opinions and that sort of thing to say we really didn't know we were violating anything but i, I just feel like the sec has a pretty has an easier job of saying well you did <laughs> so um but i agree with you like I mean, if you look at the Howey test or even the um, digital asset framework that the SEC put out, like every item you can kind of you can kind of make arguments both ways. It's not a very good test because it's a law and a framework from so long ago. And even their updated digital asset framework like doesn't um, it just adds more complexity to the analysis. It still doesn't make it like a black and white thing. Um, and so, you know, there's been like other efforts when Commissioner Peirce has suggested like a three year safe harbor um, where it projects like it, token projects could have some time while they disclose a lot of things to the SEC um, 
to become more, you know, sufficiently decentralized, something like that, where it allows projects to like really feel like they have zero risk for a while while they work on something. I mean, I just, I, I don't think that like, I don't think the climate, the SEC is creating a very friendly climate for any companies in the space. What about stable coins? What's your opinion on stable coins? And what impact do you think a potential central bank digital currency might have on stable coins? Yeah, I mean, so I have mixed feelings about it, to be honest. Um, I mean, obviously, I started my career at Silvergate Bank, I understand, like, I think that I think that it, we're a long way away from like Bitcoin replacing banks altogether. These crypto companies still need, you know, need bank accounts and need banking relationships. So in some ways, like any movement towards more adoption um, included, including like banks, like supporting the technology that stable coins and central CBDCs are, you know, uh, reliant on could be a good thing, but I think what we've seen like in other countries and what we'd see here is like right now it's kind of confusing because regulators try to point to Bitcoin as like anonymous and untraceable and that sort of thing. The true anonymous untraceable thing that we have is cash. Um, and so if the banks get rid of cash and we just have CBDCs, they actually have more tools to surveil what we're doing with cash. And like, just to be clear, like I'm an attorney, I'm not saying people should be able to go commit crimes with cash or Bitcoin, but there's some, um, it's confusing to me that people don't understand the value of financial privacy, the way you find value in other forms of privacy in your day-to-day -day lives. And so I, it's kind of a double-edged sword, I think. Um, I, and I do feel like the SEC and the Biden administration and the government in general is trying to like corral this technology by putting it back into banks and stable coins and CBDCs. Um, but that, but Bitcoin will still be, you know, over here. So um, I still think that like Bitcoin is the best and create and created what we're all like working on today, regard whether it's you know, just any any sort of innovation, I think, has really stemmed from the technology Bitcoin invented. And I think it will always hold some of those attributes that CBDCs won't. My my advice when people like ask, oh, why, why do you feel like Bitcoin is the, you know, the prevailing cryptocurrency, the best, is just like go do couple of days on a cryptocurrency exchange uh, help desk and you'll learn pretty quickly why it's kind of the uh, kind of the the answer for that one but um yeah. no I, I find it interesting I, I i think one thing that i'm interested in specifically is so for example with the sec like if they if they keep uh, having successful enforcement and say for example they win against ripple and, all, and everything goes in their favor then i wonder if they will kind of go after stablecoin like USDC, USDT, like Tether and, and so on, like stablecoin companies, um, because of they, they may for, see them as a threat against uh, a CBDC or, or whether they, I mean, it, it feels to me like they would, to be honest. Um, but then I suppose there's the other, there's the other side of the coin that they might want to work with them to maybe somehow yeah. kind of, you know, gain insight and technology to create the CBDC. So yeah, uh, I don't know I mean, where you see that going. <laughs> I mean, I think we've seen that already a bit with like Tether. I think there's a big concern that some sub stable coins aren't like what they claim to be. Um, I think, you know, the idea that like the government themselves should invent the internet or invent a stable coin, like they aren't the, they don't have the same expertise that some of these projects already have. So I think partnering with like a, um, USDC or something like that would be a smarter move. But I agree with you, like if they really want to start from scratch and sort of, you know, I think there's supposed to be an executive order coming out from the Biden administration about some of these things. Like, I think they're going to start really doing their homework. And, um, you know, I don't know what regulatory agency would sort of come after stable coins. I mean, because there's a pretty good argument that a stable coin is not a security because it's state, the price is stable. There's not like a expectation of profits or increased value or fundraising, but uh, you know, there's any, most regulators can 
have an opinion on stable coins because of the consumer protection element. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see if, if, uh, if there's sort of like government and tech partnership or if it's like competitive, like you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that's going to happen in the next, well, probably this year, to be frank, yeah. uh, a lot in the crypto landscape, a lot outside of the crypto landscape, Canada, Ukraine, lots of things going on. So this year yeah. is going to be very interesting. And I, and I wonder, especially if the SEC say they successfully start, you know, winning a lot of these enforcement uh, proceedings I, I can imagine the, the market as a whole dumping somewhat and whether bitcoin will, will hold things up or not I, i'm sure it will but time will tell um yeah. so that's going to be interesting as well um yeah. i guess uh i know we're running close to an hour ricardo did you have any more questions you wanted to ask so i've got one more that i wanted to ask yeah i got well i got two thomas wanted us to ask you uh what's your favorite winery so my my um best friend from like childhood recently bought sunstone winery near um and Santa Inez. So I'm a member there and I love that. Um, you know, I kind of loved all the, when I lived in San Francisco, I loved going to Napa and Sonoma. I think cake winery is really good. Um, yeah, I love, I love wine and Thomas knows that. So it's a good question. <laughs> uh, my other question is, it, this is my last question. Um, do you like Kraken got a, a federal banking charter and there's that other bank that, um, they're opening in Wyoming. That's like a crypto bank. Like, do you see this as like the way forward for banks, like for them to become crypto banks? Um, so yeah, so Kraken, I believe has the Wyoming um, speedy, like this, um, which is sort of a special depository institute in Wyoming. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm probably a little biased, but because I like Brian Brooks, who after Coinbase went to the OCC, the Office of Comptroller of Currency, but I think, um, so right now, like most, like a crack, let's use Kraken, for example, they would have had to, or did go state by state and get money transmitter licenses in every state. They could have gotten the bit license, but they kind of said, mm, screw you, New York. And they didn't get the bit license. I think the idea behind either like um, a state bank, like special depository institution or like the OCC trust or national bank charter is that you would have sort of more of a sole single regulate like regulatory agency to report to you wouldn't have so much state by state friction but i think some of the issues with like the state level um banking institutions is you know understanding reciprocity amongst like if you're a wyoming bank do you get to go um operate in new york or do as new york's gonna say you still need the bit license the other is that i think there's been some struggles of like getting access to fed wire and payment rails so you know for me i i i always thought that the occ trust charter and occ national bank charter would be a really interesting um path forward for some of these exchanges but i also know you know the occ is a federal regulator and maybe there's about value and just sticking to the 50 states and having the bit license and, and going from there. But what I will say is from the time I was at Silvergate to now, the relationship between banks and crypto has definitely changed. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more banks get into the crypto space. Um, I think we're going to see more crypto companies try to become banks. And I really think that in within the next like five years, it wouldn't be at um unheard of to like be able to log into your bank account and see your dollar balance and your uh crypto balance and i think that'll be a really big um yeah i think that'll be really like exciting to see i i can uh, i can agree regarding banking and um, there's a lot of banks globally that uh getting a lot more interested in being able to offer cryptocurrency to clients and, and utilize cryptocurrency as well beyond that yeah um yeah, I keep I keep being invited. So every um, state has their bankers association. So Utah Bankers Association, Florida Bankers Association, most of those conferences they have this year, they're having some sort of um, crypto day or crypto panel because banks are just finally, I think, realizing this is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, and it's a way for banks to be more innovative and turn more looking at like the fintech aspect. So, um, so definitely we're going to see a lot of action there. And yeah, I think 
I think this year from like a regulatory legal perspective is going to be insanely busy <laughs> and, um, you know, so I'll try to get some sleep here and there. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it'd be busy. I uh, fingers crossed from my perspective that things go the way I would want them to go in a slightly more decentralized favoring kind of way. Yeah. I, I, I have, my, have my doubts, but I'd like to see it go that way. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose that we, we've run about an hour, so it's probably a, a good time to, to call it in. This has been Wine and Cheese with uh, Hayley Lennon. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but it's been great to have you uh, on the podcast. Much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say? Anything you want to plug before you head out? I don't think so. I mean, uh, definitely if people are interested in the Crypto Connect thing, it's cryptoconnect.org and we'll be um, adding new cities in the next month or two. And um, they can follow me at Haley Lennon BTC on Twitter. So that's about it. I enjoyed our conversation today. Awesome. That does. And same here. I've enjoyed it. And I hope everyone out there listening has enjoyed it as well. Um, but yeah, thanks also, Ricardo, for, for joining joining me, joining us. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, we've loved having you listening. We hope you had a good time. We hope you have a good day, week, month, year. Uh, keep loving life. Keep being awesome. Take care and keep buying Bitcoin. See you soon. Mm-hmm.